there's been a lot of interest in how we can take this tool that clearly is an important research tool and incorporate it into the clinical setting. And Professor Monica Gappa is the ideal person to be giving this talk today. So her team has done lots of research in MBW, um, but importantly has really led the translational research realm of how we take what we need to know about multiple breath washouts so that it can be used in the clinical setting. So her team have looked at things like the reproducibility and repeatability of multiple breath washout, have derived normative lung function data so that we know what the upper limit of normal is. And in addition, in her center and several other centers around Europe are now using MEW clinically. And so she's able to give us a lot of insight into some of the challenges as well as the um, factors that we want to consider when we're using this test clinically. So without further delay, um, I'd like to introduce Professor Monica Gappa, who will be giving the session today. Thank you, Sonia, for this very kind introduction, but um, I don't want to start um, without sort of um, introducing you a little bit. Um, she is not only very experienced in the multiple breath washout field, but Sonia is one of, or perhaps at the moment, the um, person behind the Global Lung Initiative most of you will have heard about, and um, she has started um, developing the reference data we are currently all using and sort of has revolutionized the um, world of reference data um, for the um, respiratory society. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about multiple breath washout and the lung clearance index in a standard clinical environment. When we have started, like um, almost decades ago, it feels um, this was far away from standard clinical environment and um, we have come quite a long way. And um, yes, I think it is ready now to go into clinical practice. So, um, what I want to do is give you some background, extend a bit on what um, Sanya has briefly um, mentioned. What do we measure when we um, use multiple breath washout and what is the general purpose of using yet another lung function test? Then um, some practical issues. How do you actually do it before you go and sit down and try to do an actual test? Um, I will lead you through the test procedure so you know what to expect. Um, um, when, you, when you actually perform the test. Then I've got some clinical cases from our pediatric um, respiratory unit, um, and then I will briefly talk about current and potential applications for this um, lung function test. I'm a pediatric um, pulmonologist, and for pediatric respiratory medicine, the um, multiple breath washout started um, more than 10 years ago now when Per Gustafsson published this um, paper in the European Respiratory Journal where he had measured a group of cystic fibrosis patients from Sweden and compared them to healthy controls. And you see here the healthy controls as open circles and the cystic fibrosis patients across this age range from preschool to um, young adulthood um, as closed circles or dots. And what you see is that there is a huge overlap and that you can, um, for most patients, you can't clearly divide between patients and controls. And in this group of, a similar group of patients, he has also used multiple breath washout. And um, from the, the most commonly used parameter until now is the lung clearance index. And here you see that there is a clear distinction, even at a very young age, with most cystic fibrosis patients above this upper limit of normal for the lung clearance index. So now, why is that? And it was also um, Per Gustafsson who um, said that the lungs are not really designed to perform forced expirations, but they are designed for gas exchange. And if you look at this um, lung model here in the background, you see how complicated the lung is. And gas exchange really takes part in this most peripheral part of the lung. Um, if you look at the lung anatomy or the scheme of the lung anatomy, you see that we have at least 23 generation of airways, conducting airways, and then in the asinus, uh, uh, some generations of intra asinus airways. And if you think about spirometry, um, or using spirometry, we will only detect changes probably down to the eighth generation of airways, and then there is a much larger number, a much higher number of airway generations which are not really reflected by spirometry. These are the small airways, 
and they can be assessed using multiple breath washout. Small airways are those with a lumen of less than two millimeters in adults, and they cover 95% of the total lung volume, and yet they contribute very little to resistance, and that's why they are sort of silent for most commonly used lung function techniques, and especially spirometry. Multiple breath washout is a global measure of how efficiently um, a marker gas is cleared from the lungs. And as I said already, the lung clearance index is, a is the most popular parameter of the multiple breath washout technique, and it tells you how much volume is needed to exchange all nitrogen that is resident within the lungs um, for another gas, and in our instance, this is simply oxygen. So how long does it take until all nitrogen is washed out and replaced by pure oxygen? And it's calculated by the cumulative expired volume, so that is the sum of all breath you take for this washout divided by functional residual capacity. And if you've got changes in the small airways which lead to um, increased ventilation in homogeneity, so less even ventilation, then you have less efficient clearing of your marker gas or less efficient clearing of the nitrogen. And that means you need more breath to exchange all nitrogen in the lungs for oxygen, and that means the LCI will increase. So an increased LCI is an indication of changes within the small airways and increased ventilation in homogeneity. And this is just an example from a healthy subject where you see you only need a few breaths. Here you've got um, nitrogen washed out and you need a few breaths to clear the lungs from the nitrogen. And in a patient, and I don't want to go into detail here, but you see it takes much longer. You need um, almost double as many breaths to lower the nitrogen concentration um, until a full washout is reached, and this in turn will give you a higher LCI. Equipment and preparation is quite simple. For a nitrogen washout, you just need an oxygen, ideally wall supply, but you can also use a pressurized gas within a um, cylinder. You need a nose clip, like for most lung function tests, and you need a quiet environment. And then um, you can almost start. You have to explain the test procedure to the patient. You take height and weight, like for every other lung function test. You check ambient conditions, which will take, be taken automatically by most systems, enter patient details, and then start. It is a non-invasive test. There is obviously no risk involved, and especially in the pediatric patients, you have to tell them it doesn't hurt. The test is usually performed in an upright sitting position and all you um, tell the patient initially is that they breathe, have to breathe in a very relaxed and natural manner. Um, you also have to tell them that they have to keep the mouthpiece in their, um, um, in their mouth during the test and have to try to keep the lips tight in order to avoid leaks. They are certainly not allowed to laugh or speak during the test because that will give a leak. They may swallow because it's sometimes hard to breathe the dry air from um, the wall outlet and um, well, this will, will induce saliva production um, and they may swallow the saliva if, if necessary. Um, when we did start with these measurements, we have used videos or DVD films to distract the patient, but in the meantime, we find that is helpful. this is helpful in some patients and not in the other, so you have to find out whether you want to use videos to distract the patient during the measurement. As you can see here, um, you can do it in adults as well as in children, down to approximately age four. So once you've instructed the patient and the patient has the nose clip and the mouthpiece, you start with simple tidal breathing. And here you see an example um, of a screen um, where you should have an indication of flow and volume and an indication of your gas and your gas concentration, which you see here. Here you see the tidal breathing, and once you've established tidal breathing, you switch the patient 
uh, or for the tidal breathing. Um, for adults, you aim um, to reach a tidal volume of around one liter or 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram body weight. Once you've established tidal breathing, you can then switch into the oxygen. Um, you will see when the patient takes the first breath of oxygen that the gas concentration um, goes down here and then the next breath um, will have less nitrogen um, during the washout and you continue the washout until, ni until nitrogen reaches almost zero. And this comes here, you see the nitrogen concentration going down, you see that here as well. You continue that until you have um, three breaths below a concentration of 2%. And then the, the results will be calcula calculated if you use an, an automated or commercial device and you will get um, a result for the FRC, a result for the LCI, for the cumulative expired volume, uh, as an example, what you should check for, for quality control. And then you have to wait um, until the patient or the subject has cleared the lungs from the marker gas or from the oxygen and then you can repeat the test and usually you do this three, two or three times if you've got repeatable measurements uh, and that means the FRC has to be within 10% um, of each other. Now let's go back to the clinical application. You've seen this slide already, the very first publication in cystic fibrosis patients with um, sort of modern um, devices. And this um, result, this finding has been replicated by numerous groups since. And I think this is such a success story and I find this slide so impressive that I want to show it to you. Um, this is from all different research groups all over the world where um, you have here the LCI in um, cystic fibrosis patients and healthy controls and you find that the results for the healthy controls, irrespective of the age, um, this has been measured is quite similar and for the cystic fibrosis patients um, you find that there is a significant difference um, no matter in which lab and which research setting this has been measured. And I've brought you a few cases from our own cystic fibrosis clinic and show you how we use it. This first example is a male cystic fibrosis patient born in 2004, now aged 12 years. Um, he was di diagnosed at the age of three years with a presentation of both, both GI and respiratory. At presentation, he was already pseudomonas positive and had repeated eradication treatment um, after diagnosis and again two years later. His spirometry has fortunately been normal all the time with an um, vital capacity and um, FEV1 of around 100%. He also had normal body plethysmography. And um, in 2011, we started using the um, multiple breath washout in our clinic. Um, we saw a very mild but gradual increase in, um, lung, uh, in the lung clearance index over years. In 2011, we also started to do routine low-dose CT scans in our cystic fibrosis patients. And from 2011 to the next scan in 2014, we saw a um, mild increase in um, bronchiectasis in this patient. In 2015, he um, got mucoid um, Pseudomonas cultured, um, intensified, we intensified treatment, including intravenous treatment for four times during one year. And at present, his LCI returned back to normal despite these changes in here, the large airway seen on the, cystic, uh, on the CT scan. So I think this is an example that um, the um, lung clearance index sort of um, reflects what's going on clinically um, in these patients. This is another example of an older cystic fibrosis patient. He's almost adult now at an age of 17. He was diagnosed quite late at seven years and he had only intermittent colonization with a Staphylococcus aureus except for one single um, um, positive culture for Burkholderia um, almost six years ago. 
he had normal spirometry all the time a normal means well above 100 percent predicted and also had normal body plethysmography when he started doing regular lung clearance index measurements his um, lci was at 7.95 and his first CT scan, although he was clinically so well, showed bronchiectasis. Here you've got his CT scan, so quite normal parenchyma here, but significant bron bronchiectasis here in the upper lobes. I only got one slide of the uh, one, one section of the CT, of course. Um, and since 2014, he had a continuous increase in lung clearance index until now. This, although his spirometry remained really where it was before with a vital capacity of 128% predicted, which um, is equal to a Z, core, a Z score of plus 2.4 and also a normal FV1. And the LCI is now above 9. Here, this is the most recent CT scan. Now, unfortunately, this boy, um, he is almost adult, so we are discussing these results um, with the um, intention to um, do more intensive diagnostic workup, including bronchoscopy, because we uh, couldn't get any secretions from him and look for um, bacteria, which we wouldn't get from a deep throat swab, but um, he doesn't want to undergo bronchoscopy, so we don't know what's going on here. Um, but again, as an example, the LCI indicates much better than spirometry that there is something going on and that we should start treating this boy more intensively than we do at the moment. And another case from the cystic fibrosis um, clinic, an, um, a school child, a female patient this time, aged nine years now. She was diagnosed at birth with meconium ileus. Um, she had Staphylococcus aureus for most of the time, just intermittently. She also, like most pediatric patients, has normal spirometry and normal body plethysmography. She had a first positive culture for Pseudomonas a bit more than a year ago. And unfortunately, early eradication treatment failed in this patient, and she's now chronically colonized with Pseudomonas, but it's still a non-mucoid strain. On CT, she has very mild bronchiectasis, um, uh, has mild bronchitis, but no bronchiectasis, which is different from the other two patients I showed you. And um, in this patient, the um, multiple breath washout and the lung clearance index remained normal throughout. So again, reassuring us as clinicians that this patient might have um, pseudomonas colonization, but with the treatment we currently do, we keep everything under control. No major changes on um, CT. Certainly no changes in spirometry and also um, reassuringly a normal LCI despite this um, bacterial colonization. Now, um, I think the correlation between structural changes seen on CT and functional changes um, is quite important in cystic fibrosis. And um, we have actually done a study where we have looked at that in a group of patients with very mild cystic fibrosis lung disease, all with an FEV1 of above 80% predicted. And um, we have seen or we have been able to show that um, the LCI really correlates much better with structural changes seen on the CT than spirometry. And this, um, I hope, um, I have been able to show you from our clinical cases as well. Also, the observation that um, depending on the nature of bacterial um, colonization or bacterial um, cultures in cystic fibrosis patients has been um, published in a bigger study from the Bern um, department um, in Switzerland where they have shown that there is a correlation between the lung clearance index and um, pseudomonas, status of pseudomonas infection where um, the patients who've never had pseudomonas um, grown from their um, microbiology cultures have a lung clearance index which is almost or very similar to uh, that seen in healthy controls and as pseudomonas infection goes on being intermittent to chronic there is an increase in lung clearance uh, in the lung clearance index sort of reflecting the status um, of the patient 
And one other thing, which I think is very important to remember when you start introducing um, multiple breath washout into your clinic, the lung clearance index has prognostic value for the patient. And this is data um, from the London Cystic Fibrosis Collaborative Group, where they have collected um, lung function data in preschool children and then retested um, at school age. The um, LCI measured during preschool years um, predicts um, the outcome for the lung clearance index at school age. So those with a normal LCI at preschool age are very likely to remain normal to school age. So when you have a patient with um, normal preschool LCI, they are much more likely to end up with normal um, spirometry at school age, whereas those, um, those patients with a high abnormal LCI during preschool years, they will end up with abnormal spirometry in school age. So these are the patients we then have to really worry about. Now, cystic fibrosis is one topic for multiple breath washout, but um, if you look at PubMed, you will find that there is an increasing number of publications for the lung clearance index, and that this is just the result. When you enter lung clearance index, you see the increase in publications until 2015. Obviously, 2016 will be even more because this is only half the year reflected here. For um, primary ciliary dyskinesia, and there are um, some publications showing that um, the lung clearance index might have a value which is similar to cystic fibrosis, um, the sensitivity compared to spirometry as well as compared to computed tomography, is really similar to that in um, patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, and for PCD patients in, in the clinical context, I think this means that if you find an increased LCI in these patients, you need further diagnostic workup because you have to suspect worsening lung disease and might have to intensify your treatment. Another case I've brought you is um, this of a six-year-old male who um, has been sick with um, severe uh, episodes of severe wheezy bronchitis from um, the age of two, when he, which start, when he started with a lower respiratory tract infection of unknown um, sort of etiology, so there was no organism detected. He was able to perform spirometry, and spirometry in this, in this boy wasn't normal, but um, was also com consistent or compatible with the diagnosis of asthma, showing some reversibility of 15% of the FEV1. Um, on body plethysmography, he had severe hyperinflation, so from this you can guess this is not normal preschool asthma. But then he underwent um, computed tomography, and you should see that there is sort of a mosaic pattern and some areas of severe hyperinflation and some other areas um, with um, normal pharyngioma, which um, um, is suspicious um, of um, something else but um, just um, regular preschool asthma. Um, he underwent um, multiple breath washout testing and this came out with a lung clearance index of 11, which is markedly elevated for um, a young school boy. And um, this, uh, this boy actually had um, bronchiolitis obliterans, perhaps following adenovirus infection or some other um, lower respiratory tract infection which was never identified. It is very easy to set up. You just really need an oxygen wall supply to start the measurement when you've got the equipment. It is easy to perform from early childhood to old age in any environment that is used to doing lung function testing. You have to be aware that because it's a tidal breathing measurement and you are washing out and you have to wait in between and then you are washing out again, it takes more time than spirometry or body plethysmography. But we have um, um, a huge number of studies in the meantime and also clinical experience um, that um, to say that there is good evidence for an added clinical value of using multiple breath of washout definitely in cystic fibrosis and especially in the pediatric population and in those patients with milder lung disease. This is probably similar for um, PCD 
there are increasing applications in adult diseases like um, COPD or um, chronic heart failure. So I think it is time to say um, that you should start using multiple breath washout and the LCI to better understand your patient's problem, especially if you think there is a patient who might have problems within the so-called small airways. And that was all uh, before you go for the practical measurement now. Thank you. So we will um, take a few questions before we move on to the practical session, and then we'll split you into two groups so you can have a look at the machine and, and test your own LCI. Thank you very much for this presentation. Do we have any studies showing that management based on LCI is doing better than managing with what we use uh, actually at the moment? That is a very critical question, and I was sort of expecting that. We have hardly any test uh, where uh, uh, that is true for spirometry, for body plethysmography, and for multiple breath washout. We don't have evidence that um, using these parameters will actually change clinical outcome. But, I mean, if you look at um, the cystic fibrosis patients where we've got most evidence, it is very likely the earlier you start treatment, the better your outcome is, and with the LCI, Perhaps similar to the CT, you will detect changes where you could act on um, looking for microbiology um, or um, bacterial colonization, bacteria infection, and then start treating accordingly. So um, I can't imagine that um, it will not help to improve your clinical outcome. For cystic fibrosis, I would say that. Yeah. Looking at uh, your presentation, it seems uh the procedures are similar to the uh, nitrogen washout for lung volumes. Do you see any correlation between the lung volumes ut utilizing the nitrogen washout and the, your index? Um, well, the uh, calculation of the LCI is based on nitrogen washout on the, when I, the multiple breath washout and is nitrogen washout. So what you do is you measure your functional residual capacity and um, the time it takes to um, measure functional residual capacity or to wash out the entire volume you need to calculate your FRC. Um, that will reflect, that is reflected by the lung clearance index. The longer it takes to wash out, the, mm, the more breath you need to wash out, the higher your lung clearance index is. Um, so this is not related to the FRC. Um, the FRC should remain stable um, unless you've got um, severe hyperinflation um, and the lung clearance index will reflect um, both the airways and, and the way the washout, um, the, the, the lungs are ventilated. I don't know whether that's clear, no. It's clear, actually, and I'm thinking of uh, the diffusion capacity. So the DL, we, we do the DLCO to see how good is the lung uh, diffusion capacity, and the nitrogen washout, you see how much it sort of it takes for the lung to clear up the nitrogen. Yes. So I would think maybe in adult there would be some correlation, if you, anyone can. Yeah. That is a very interesting question, especially in, more adult, in the more adult type lung disease. If you think about um, COPD, you will um, get the m more information when you combine these two measures of DLCO and um, the um, lung clearance index, I expect, because um, yeah, it's um, small airways and um, gas exchange at the alveolar level is, is different and will add to a fuller picture of a fi full picture of the disease. Yes, but um, I I'm not aware. Um, there are a few studies coming out now, um, and they seem to suggest that um, these two parameters reflect dis different aspects of the disease. So it's a combination of the two. Do you think uh, uh, that instead of using like a cutoff point around 7.8 is correct? Uh, because we found that in, in our children around 8.1, but uh, what I am hearing is probably that it's best to use the number like a longitudinal Mm -hmm. I mean, just to see how the patient uh, is during the disease, 
instead of using just a cutoff point? Mm, well, I think you should always refer to a reference population and um, the reference data we have got so far um, suggest that there is a very stable um, upper limit of normal for most of the age groups we are looking at. Um, it is slightly different if you look at very young children or infants and it again starts to, or the upper limit of normal starts to increase probably at the beginning of the fourth decade. So you have to expect higher LCI um, if you look at an adult population, but for children um, you can assume a very constant upper limit of normal which is slightly dependent on the machine you are using. Um, but um, roughly 7.5 will um, be good as an upper limit of normal. Uh, it is possible to see any uh, bronchodilator response using the LCI? Um, yes and no. Depends what you are looking at. Um, it's probably the least good technique for asthma and it will not replace other lung function measures in um, patients with asthma. But um, I think it's a very good research tool in order to understand what is going on in the small airways in asthma and what has been shown, yes, that you can detect a bronchodilator response and you can also detect that um, small airways changes remain um, even after you've got a um, clinically relevant bronchodilator response. Um, so if you compare spirometry and multiple breath washout. Sorry, I can just, if I can just add to your question, um, we've had a couple of patients, asthmatic patients, who have been quite uh, bronchoconstriction and really difficult to get them to wash out. But then when we give them a bronchodilator, it improved, and then we give them a further bronchodilator, it improved more and more. So we did see that in a couple of our patients mm -hmm. that we were using. My question is, um, now I know there's differences between the SF6 and the nitrogen washout. Um, what about differences in the machine between the Echomedics and the EZ? <laughs> yeah, is there being that being correlated or what's the differences? <laughs> or like, Can we compare one machine to the other and get the LCI to be the same? Um, actually, I can't give you a definite answer to that yet because we are working on that in an international group um, right now again. Um, there have been differences differences between the machines. There are some differences between SF6 and nitrogen washout measurements, um, but the overall message from all these um, um, equipment, different equipment types is the same, that um, we have got a very constant range of normal and a very clear distinction between health and disease. Okay, but if we changed over machines in a clinic, it may give us different parameters, you think? Or? Not different parameters. I mean, you may um, have... Um, slightly different results and I think you have to establish for yourself the difference between um, for your patients. So it's not, uh, with the current, yeah. with the current equipment, the feeling is that we are very close. I would second that. So I would not recommend changing equipment or if you do, you, I wouldn't recommend comparing results between the two devices but we are certainly getting much closer and the differences have been in kind of minor calculations which have been worked out and I think over the next couple months the ultimate goal is that the devices are interchangeable just like with spirometry or body boxes. And actually to add to that, I think we are, we are much closer than if you look at two different body boxes.